So, um, my name is uh, Miriam Palosari Eladhari, uh, and I'm a, a game designer. I just started um, in the studio just a few days ago. Uh, I'm also uh, a researcher affiliated to uh, the University of Malta and to Stockholm University um, in Sweden. So, I've been teaching games for for a while, since 2004. Um, and this talk is a case study uh, of, of a course uh, concerned with AI-based game design and computational expression. Um, and the reason that I want to give this talk is to show you how it's possible to enable students uh, to expand their technological palette, how they can make uh, AI technologies as part of their artistic practice as designers. Um, uh, it's uh, something that's super empowering uh, to know that, that you have uh, lots of technologies at your fingertips. Um, and for those who are already uh, proficient, they will, uh, in coding and using these technologies, uh, it's also a way to show that, okay, so this is the charted territory, um, and that makes it possible to see what is uncharted and where you can do uh, innovations and, and new things. Um, in designing this course, I wanted to make it accessible for uh, both programmers and non-programmers. Uh, so the kind of so the mix of technologies um, that we have been using uh, are things that that can be used just off the shelf, even if you don't know how to program. However, um, uh, the students uh, that I've had are mostly uh, programmers. Uh, just uh, shortly, what AI-based game design means, it's simply when the AI is in the foreground and central for designing a game, um, simply put. Um, so, uh, back in 2011, I was spending a lot of time in, in, in Santa Cruz and having lots of good uh, discussion with some of my favorite collaborators, uh, Josh McCoy, uh, Gillian Smith, and Anne Sullivan. And uh, we started to compare uh, how do we work uh, with AI and design. And we could see commonalities. Uh, first of all, we could see that we usually kind of looked at uh, three different knowledge domains all across the case studies uh, that we did. Usually having one rich metaphor of a system like personality psychology or social behavior. Um, and then some sort of either existing AI technology or whatever we were building. Uh, and also uh, the type of genre that we were kind of adhering to when we were doing our development, if any. Um, we also kind of uh, saw that back then the main challenges that we were facing in our own practice was how to make the, uh, the AI really be foregrounded. How uh, how do you make it transparent to the player that something interesting is happening uh, so that you don't have a super uh, tailspin-like uh, system where you don't see what's on the surface um, and how it's played. Another one was looking at uh, particular sweet spots for emergence, like when uh, a game is fun and understandable but still rich and something that you can explore. So uh, we reasoned a lot about that. Uh, and then when I designed uh, the course, um, Computational Expression, um, I tried to find a way to uh, give this uh, to the students. Uh, like at the same time, give them a method for how to work with it in design and also give them a palette uh, of AI methods. But not only AI methods, also some interesting input technologies and things um, like uh, Oculus or, or Connect. The things like that. Um, and uh, uh, practically about the course, uh, it's a five ECTS course, and in Europe this means uh, uh, that one ECTS is 25 hours of student work, um, and one semester is 30 ECTSs in total. So this was a sixth of a semester time, and the semester is four and a half months long. Um, so the students uh, that I had, they were from, uh, this was given at the University of Malta. Mostly they were bachelors in computing science, but also 
uh, a few of them didn't have programming backgrounds. They also already knew how to iteratively design and develop games because they were students in our, our uh, master's uh, game design master. Um, the course, we used um, the um, great book, Expressive Processing, by Noah Wardrip Fruin, as our kind of red line uh, in our tech seminars. Um, and, and we had workshops and some guest lectures. Um, and this is kind of what the... I'm first going to see the, the course was divided into two main parts, um, where the first six weeks was an, in, was an intense period of, um, of knowledge gathering, so having seminars um, and workshops. And this is kind of like uh, the things which are kind of on that top, top, top row there. Those were the kind of the technological palette that I wanted to give my students. Uh, I mean, whoever kind of like when you use this, you use the things which you think is, okay, what are the technologies that exist and could be useful for game design? And these were the ones that we kind of looked at. Uh, basically having um, AI-based game design, that was one of the starting points, and also looking at methods for research prototyping, like how can you answer a research question by posing it as a, it, as a prototype. Um, looking at agents and characters, uh, interactive narrative systems for that. Uh, game worlds, how you build uh, uh, full, rich ontologies uh, for game uh, systems for help, help you create those. Uh, looking at procedurally generated content uh, methods, data mining, big data. Uh, and, and, and then also the kind of the toolbox and the toy box uh, using things like biodata um, and, and other types of uh, inputs like, like the Kinect or or things like that, mainly looking at the huge area of the presence research um, and, and immersion. Um, and this was kind of also interspersed with hands-on workshops when students use these technologies. Um, so, uh, and at the end of this six-week uh, period, the students delivered a game concept, like uh, what are we going to build? Um, when we had the tech seminars, we divided up all the readings among the group. So each student uh, picked the technology uh, he or she was most interested in and then championed that and kind of held that seminar and presented the tech to or, or the tool or the approach to the group. And we had a discussion about that. Um, but in, in addition uh, to just reading papers, um, I invited uh, guest speakers who could give demonstrations like, okay, uh, Richard Evans uh, Skyped in and said, this is how I developed Versu. This is how I think about um, narrative when I build this system. Uh, it was also a good uh, opportunity for the students to ask about basic BDI uh, agent architectures. Um, Jillian Smith uh, showed uh, her uh, prototype, The Endless Web, um, and students also read her publications so that when she Skyped, Skyped in, uh, they could both kind of get a hands-on demonstration of her work, uh, but also ask questions about her academic uh, publications on that. Brian McGurko uh, showed his um, Viewpoints AI, where, where a, a dancing pl a player is kind of represented in a very artistic manner. Also, an interesting way to use computation for artistic expression. We had Noah uh, also uh, Skyping in, since we had his book as the red thread in the talk, uh, in, the, in the whole course. Um, uh, so, uh, mainly talking about the different effects, like how you kind of like, you, you, how you can use the ELISA effect, how how you try to not be in the tailspin effect when, when this, your super impressive, fantastic AI system is not really visible to the player, uh, even though it's a fantastically beautiful system, and instead use the SimCity effect where you have this rich metaphor really feeding into the design and making it accessible uh, for, for the player. Uh, in the workshops, we, we were both looking at uh, digital systems, but we were also doing uh, paper prototyping AI, and this was especially to make it accessible for non-programmers. Like, um, if you do a paper prototyping 
of the strip system, for example, building, building a story together uh, in groups. You literally can't walk out of the room not understanding plan-based problem solvers. It's, uh, it's something that I really kind of recommend uh, as, as doing when you teach um, AI to also combine it with these kind of more tangible hands-on methods for teaching. So uh, the, uh, the tasks uh, that, that, the, uh, that the students got was um, uh, to, when they brainstormed, look at, choose one uh, AI technology uh, from, uh, from the palette and choose one rich metaphor from real life. So those were the two starting points. The third one, looking at the kind of the, the game conventions in, in the design, uh, it was something that they should be aware of uh, so that they, uh, so if they were using game design conventions, uh, they would be kind of uh, know when they, 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 they made something innovative. Uh, the development process, it was iterative. They already knew how to, what cycles to go through with play testing and iteration, so they kind of did that naturally. I didn't have to teach that part in, in the course. So I'm going to show a few quick examples uh, uh, of games. Um, uh, so one, this is Highway Code. It's, it's a small racing game where the students used machine learning uh, as the central technology and use kind of traffic systems on Malta as, as their main knowledge domain. Uh, so uh, in, in the game, the, the cars learned how to have the kind of the right speed. Uh, Compo Blocks is another game that the students oh. made where uh, we're using procedurally generated uh, platforms for music composition. So, um, so just the... Uh, Playing, by playing the game, um, you would uh, uh, compose music as you went along, and the little uh, and, and the little uh, platforms there kind of they emerge in real time during play. Um, so, but also bear in mind that these little prototypes were made, uh, uh, you know, in just a few days' time. They didn't have much time for this kind of development. Another example. Uh, is Organatron, where students use PCG in, uh, in combination with the genetic algorithms um, um, to make a robot war uh, strategy game that was played by two players who share the, the keyboard and kind of watch their little robots evolve. It was very fun. Um, another one was a dungeon crawler um, uh, procedurally generating um, uh, uh, so, so it was kind of this mixed, uh, mixed media thing that you, you would uh, get support for how to build your dungeons for your kind of board game role play uh, that you would play. Uh, so it was uh, looking at quest flags and, and PCG uh, quests. So there were also two, a couple of, of people, uh, groups uh, used input uh, uh, technologies instead of AI as the central part, which is totally viable as well, at least within the scope of this course, uh, so uh, once we're using uh, the gyro as the central thing and, and the Heracles myth uh, with, with being attacked by birds, so mounting, mounting the, um, uh, a cell phone using the gyro uh, to play a level of that. Another uh, was uh, using a uh, multi-device uh, to kind of have, um, to play, um, uh, uh, to play a kind of art game. So. Um, to, to win, your squigglies uh, need to kind of traverse to the end of the screen, um, and, and, and you'd have um, uh, have a kind of art piece being created uh, as you play. And they were inspired by minimalist art and used the yellow tail code base uh, for doing that and did their own thing. Um, so the resulting things. This is kind of like the competitive mode or the fight mode. Um, and, and this would be the kind of result of that play. Um, those, the collaborative play part, uh, were, were resulting in, in, uh, in, in images that kind of looked uh, a bit like this. Um, so after this month of prototyping, um, 
there was a development stop in order to reflect. And this was a very important part of the course um, because uh, you can't really make sense of all these technologies un unless you get time to really reflect about how can you use this in your own artistic practice as a designer in the future. Um, and some of the questions they were looking at was kind of going back to how the technology and the design affect um, each other. Um, so looking at the course structure, uh, the last, uh, the, the three ending months of the course after the knowledge gathering uh, phase uh, was spent one month prototyping and testing, then a full reflection phase where people wrote, wrote reports and played each other's games, but then also making sure that they had a full month for polish so that the feedback that they got from each other uh, and from me was something that they could use uh, in, in their, their absolute last iteration. The, uh, what, what I saw as a teacher, which was, which was strangely obvious, was that those groups and students who, who were really embracing the idea to have a rich metaphor from real life that they were kind of using in their design work were the ones who, who made the most uh, innovative and interesting games uh, during this uh, short uh, dev time that they had. Um, another thing that, uh, that I saw was that because I was using this kind of um, traditional style uh, defense, um, um, def having kind of people defend their argument in class, uh, combining that academic rigor together with practical work uh, was something that it kind of fed into each other nicely. The outcomes for the students uh, was that they got games to put into their portfolios. Uh, some got seeds for research papers uh, that they then were writing. Uh, it was also a kind of feasibility test for their forthcoming thesis work, something that we would spend a year doing. Uh, so that is kind of a, a time saver there. Um, and an important thing too uh, was to have a hands-on experience of what it means to build an AI module specifically for a game. Uh, because uh, the, the, the process of iterations together with the game design is really fun, but it's also resource heavy. And this is something which is very good to know when you go uh, out in, in, in the industry that is not, you know, sometimes it's a super good idea, but maybe not always. Um, but most important um, was that uh, the students have really gotten an idea about a palette for how to use technology and also see uh, where, where can we innovate and where can we do new things that doesn't exist already? Um, the, um, the course materials and stuff is possible to download. Uh, I just uh, threw up all the PDFs and, and things on that address. So if anyone is in, interested, in it, it's all there. I'll put the slides there as well. And that's it. Questions? Hi. Thank you for your talk. Uh, if I understand well, in this course, they have to program their own AI. Do you have other courses for the same student when they use uh, standard uh, tools, AIs you find in engines and using uh, industrial yes. tools for AI? Yes, in addition, in the program, there is a, a several game AI courses and also PCG uh, courses for those who do the technology strand. So, um, so they already, most of the students already have lots of things, kind of technologies on, on their fingertips that they can use. So this is not, this course doesn't exist in isolation. Okay, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>